What's going on, everybody? It's Tuesday. Time for Swift News doesn't have the same ring to it. Apologies for the day late. I just moved into a new apartment, and here's what I'm working with. Temporary setup, no furniture yet. The internet just got turned on. That's why we're a day late. Uh, and I apologize in advance for any echo. As you can see, this is what I'm working with. An empty apartment with hardwood flooring. Not great for audio. But we're going to do our best. We're going to make it work. Here's the rundown, and let's get into it. First up, we have a new feature in Swift UI. John Sundell here is demonstrating it, uh, generating automatic placeholders for Swift UI views. As you can see here, new in Xcode 12 beta 3, a built-in modifier that makes it really easy to add a placeholder view. Now, a placeholder view, what are we talking about? Well, let's quickly shift over to Thomas Ricard's uh, Reddit client that he's making out in the open. It's open source. He's tweeting about it a lot. If you're not following him, give him a follow, check it out. But as you can see here in the picture, you get these nice placeholder views. It's, it's called redacted actually, but it just, you know, you've seen this before in apps, but it probably took a lot more to actually get that going. But here in SwiftUI, you get it out of the box, uh, which is awesome. So back to John's article, uh, he shows you, you know, how to do it. And you can hover over the preview here. This is what the view normally would look like, the Markdown Basics by John Sandell. Uh, if you scroll down here, you can see that he added the redacted reason placeholder. And then now if you preview it, you get this nice redacted placeholder view, basically for free out of the box. That's pretty sweet. And you can do a little bit more with this view as John goes into through the rest of the article. So I recommend checking that out, but we're gonna keep it moving. So we got a lot of stories to cover here. So next up, another uh, new in Xcode beta three. So if you haven't downloaded that beta, I'd recommend it. Uh, but Federico here discovered that I'm just excited, right? <laughs> Swift UI inputs automatically avoid the keyboard. No extra work needed. Anybody that's been developing iOS for a while knows avoiding the keyboard. Uh, is a nightmare and there's like 10 different ways to do it. There's no like standard way. Well, here in SwiftUI, it looks like it's just out of the box. The inputs are gonna avoid it. I'm sure in complex UIs, it's probably not that simple, but for just a simple text input, uh, there you go. Next, let's talk about sidebar navigation in Swift UI. If you watched any of the iPad videos at WWDC, you know the sidebar uh, is a thing. Like it's a major thing. It's pretty much replacing the tab bar when it comes to iPad apps. What is the sidebar if you're not familiar? Uh, here you see this bar on the left and this is called like the three column kind of style that is basically gonna be the standard for iPad apps. At least that's how it feels. Um, so Majid here helps you out with how to build this sidebar uh, in Swift UI. Here you get this sidebar struct uh, and you see you get a list here, list style, sidebar list style. Uh, and if you wanna dive more into the details here, again, check out the article. Majid's got some good source code for you to, to play around with. And speaking of Swift UI views, gotta thank today's sponsor, and that is fellow YouTuber, fellow community member, Mark Moykins and his Swift UI views mastery book. Now I enjoyed Mark's book because as you can see on the screen, it is highly visual. You got the code on the right and then what the code does on the left, oftentimes animated as well. I love that. And Mark has spent the past couple weeks updating the book fully for all the new stuff in Swift UI that was just announced with iOS 14 and is clearly marked in the book what's the new stuff versus what's the old stuff. And this book is currently on sale for 40% off, but only until July 28th. So if you're watching this after then, eh, sorry, but you can still check it out. Link will be in the description. And after you've checked out the free trial, if you like what you see, check out this giant bundle Mark has with, you know, it's got the book, the full Xcode projects, flashcards, everything you need to know to learn about Swift UI views. All right, back to the show. Moving on to Mac Catalyst, um, over the past year, we've seen Apple release, you know, first party Swift UI tutorials, and they've been really great. Uh, now we get a Catalyst one. So how to bring an iPad app to the Mac with Catalyst. And as you can see, it's quite lengthy, right? About three hours and 25 minutes to do the whole thing. So it's not just a quick little snippet here. Um, so this is basically like the overview page. You have different sections, uh, you know, Mac Catalyst essentials, sidebar navigation, right? We just talked about that, uh, toolbars, interface. But anyway, the whole uh, tutorial, it starts with the starter project to get you going on how to convert an iPad app to the Mac with Catalyst. So if you have an existing iPad app out there and you're thinking about adopting Catalyst, this is for you. 
Next up, we have a must watch for all iOS developers from Christy Veers here, uh, and it's about accessibility, how a blind person would use their phone. Now I can't have the audio, so I recommend going to the link and actually checking this out and watching the video because she's, she's talking through everything she's doing, um, but it's just really eye-opening to see how a blind person uses the app, how they rub their finger over it and they get a little haptic feedback and voiceover. Um, so this will really open your eyes into why accessibility is so important. Hopefully you don't have to have that beaten into you. Hopefully you know that already. Um, but it's just really, really eye-opening. I have a cousin who's personally blind who has, I've watched him do this and I was like in awe how he can navigate through his phone uh, like this. Cause you know, we're so used to, you know, being able to see things. So anyway, uh, if you're not familiar with accessibility or you've never seen, you know, maybe a blind person use their phone, absolutely must watch. Next up, we have Jordan Morgan in Spenstack, year one. Now I feature Jordan a bunch on the show uh, because he's sharing openly his, his indie developer journey. And if you've followed me, you know I'm, I love hearing that. I'm fascinated by that. In fact, I'm looking to shift into that for 2021. I got a lot of consulting, you know, with Aluna, another consulting project. Once I wrap those up by the end of the year, I'm shifting my focus to my own indie app. Of course, I'll still be making YouTube videos and courses and all that stuff, gotta, gotta pay the bills, but I'll be focusing a lot on building an indie app and sharing. Like Jordan has inspired me to share the whole journey. I mean, I'm a YouTuber, of course I was gonna share it. But anyway, I highly recommend checking out this article by Jordan. He just recaps the year of Spendstack, right? Uh, his first year. So 4.3 thousand downloads, 15K, not bad, not bad. And he talks about that later in the article, um, how you can still make it on the app store. You know, 15,000 might not be enough to live off of, but that's pretty nice supplemental income. Um, I'm just gonna scroll through this quickly because I, again, highly encourage you to check it out, but it talks about cool stuff that happened, uh, challenging parts, you know, rewarding parts. Again, I'm just kind of biggest fails, biggest learnings. Definitely go check out this article. Um, again, I, I love this stuff. I'm so happy that Jordan decided to kind of share the journey of Spenstack. Next up, got a quick one by John Sindel. He launched a new section of his website called Questions and Answers. So basically, you know, as, as content creators in the space, we get asked a lot of questions all the time. Oftentimes the same questions over and over again, just being honest. So John kind of took that and said, you know what, I need to have a questions and answers section on my site. So, right, like what's my workflow for writing and publishing articles? Uh, is using weak self always required when working with closures? Just very common questions. Now this just launched, so there's only a few of them up there. But of course, over time, you know, John's going to be building this. Moving on, we have understanding the importance of abstractions by Donnie Walls here. Now, abstractions, in my opinion, fall into the art of programming category. Like there's no concrete right or wrong answer. It's, it's very vague and nuanced based on the situation. And that's kind of what Donnie goes into here. Um, first of all, he talks about what abstractions are, knowing when to write them. I'm, I'm going fast because I want to get to one point here, but he'd also give some examples on designing an abstraction. But here's what I wanted to really focus this section on. Um, so things to watch out for when writing abstractions, because this is the trap that I believe basically every developer falls into. Here you go, here it is. Once you get the hang of abstracting code, it's very tempting to go overboard, right? And this also brings me back to a, uh, a little saying, I can't remember who said it, so I can't attribute it, I'm sorry, but it wasn't me, I'm not taking credit. Uh, but it was just a small thing is in programming, don't mistake brevity for clarity. Brevity meaning like conciseness, shortness, right? Just because it's super short, concise does not mean that it's super clear. Uh, and the reason I say that is, you know, when you start going crazy abstracting things, like, yeah, you may end up with a four line view controller and you may be proud of yourself. Like, look, my view controller is only four lines of code. Look how clean and neat it is, so readable. And that's true, it's readable, but oftentimes if you have like seven layers of abstractions, trying to work on that view controller, like, like adding a new feature to that screen or something like that is a nightmare because you have to sift through seven layers of abstraction. So it's certainly possible to go way overboard on abstractions. And that's why I say this falls into the art of programming because many of you out there are probably saying, well, how do I know what's too much abstractions versus what's not? And like I said, there's no concrete answer. It's something that you have to, you just learn that with experience. And how do you get that experience? You go overboard <laughs> abstracting it, right? You create that nice way over abstracted thing. And then when you have to go back and work on it, you're gonna be like, shit, this is a nightmare. <laughs> like, why did I do this? So then you kind of learn to dial it back. And you know, sometimes, you know, that four line view controller might look beautiful, but oftentimes maybe the 50 line view controller is much more clear, much easier to work on uh, and so forth. So again, small uh, number of lines of code does not necessarily mean like great code. 
But that's just my rant on it. That's how I feel about it. Definitely check out Donnie's article here. Cause again, like he gives you an example, shows you what to watch out for, when to do it. Um, because again, anything that falls into the art of programming, again, in my opinion, is don't just take one person's word for it, right? Get a bunch of different opinions and then experiment with it and start forming your own. So anyway, all right. I think we've talked about abstractions enough. Next up in the no shit category, uh, tech sector jobs assess anxiety, not software skills. So this is a, a study done from North Carolina State University and Microsoft finds that technical interviews uh, currently used for hiring software engineering positions test whether the job candidate has performance anxiety rather than uh, if they're competent at coding. So I'll scroll down to what the study actually was. So basically what they did was uh, 48 computer science graduates, undergrads, and they gave half of them a private interview, which means that Here's the problem, here's the whiteboard, we're gonna leave you in a room by yourself, you got an hour or whatever, do it. But you don't have anybody looking over your shoulder, you're not explaining everything as you go, you know, the interviewer's not asking you questions, interrupting your thought process, right? And then the other half, they gave that traditional interview, which what I just said happens, right? The interviewer's there asking you questions, people are looking over your shoulder, and you know, so, Suffice to say, I think you all know where this is going. The people that had the private room, the private uh, interview, did way better than the ones who had people, you know, looking over their shoulder. And then the study attributes that to just performance anxiety, right? Like, I've said this time and time again, like, I can't type my name if somebody's, like, looking over my shoulder saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, it's like, fuck, get out of here, you know? So, like I said, anyone that's done one of these interviews is like, yeah, of course that's what it is. But, uh, you know, this was interesting that it was done by North Carolina State and Microsoft. Um, so they kind of teamed up to uh, find this. But anyway, thought that was pretty interesting. Wanted to share. Moving on to a new segment that I'm calling Twitter Wisdom, <laughs> because I find so many cool threads on Twitter uh, that I just want to share it. Here by Sarah Dian says, I've been working as a software engineer for 10 years. Man, does time fly. Basically, here's a list of 10 honest takes uh, about the job. And I'm only going to go through a couple. Links will be in the description. As always, definitely check out the thread. But, you know, we'll do a couple here. Years of experience don't mean anything without quality of experience. And I think a lot of people think like this, like, oh, I've been developing for five years. I'm a senior developer. Like, time means nothing. And that's kind of what she's saying, right? Doing stuff for a long time doesn't mean you're getting better. Stagnation is real, right? If you're not actively trying to improve, like, time doesn't automatically make you improve, right? You've got to constantly be trying and constantly learning. Um, uh, I love this. On many subjects, there is no absolute truth. Uh, the internet is filled with opinions. Look at it as food for thought, not gospel. And this goes all the way to, should I do web development? Should I do mobile development? Uh, should we do React Native or native? Uh, storyboards or, or code, right? Like all that stuff, right? So many opinions. Um, the truth is, and I, again, I've said this time and time again, every decision like that, like web development, mobile development, all that, like, that's such a unique nuanced decision for that individual. Or when it comes to, should you write you know, native or React Native? Again, that's a unique business decision for your app. So the, the problem is that the internet, like she says, is full of opinions and right, uh, par you know, here, parroting the latest thing you read doesn't make you smart. Consume content to stay current, but also keep a critical mind. And to be honest with you, I think there's a lot of this going on on the internet, that, that parroting here. Um, and then there's one more I wanna touch on here. Um, at the very end, the last one, again, I highly recommend checking out the whole thread, but if you've followed me for a while, you know I preach Twitter, I preach Twitter, I know many of you are actually on Twitter because you've watched some of my videos and I told you to get on Twitter, but here it is. Who you know is as important as what you know. There are humans behind computers, it's not just uh, about hard skills, it's also about making connections and fostering relationships. You don't have to become Twitter famous, but reaching out to people goes a long way. Like I said, networking on Twitter is so huge, especially for those of you trying to get not only your first job, but maybe maybe you do want to work at something like Twitter and you need a, a connection at Twitter. Like, Twitter's how you find it. That's I said Twitter a lot in that sense. Moving on. Next, we have uh, Danny Thompson. This is a quick one here. Uh, that senior developer who is a genius in one subject is a junior developer in another subject. So that's just something to keep in mind for perspective. Like, I think I know a decent amount about Swift. You have me write HTML and CSS, I'm an idiot. <laughs> JavaScript, I know nothing. So, and you can even go within iOS, right? Say the app I've been working on for years now is heavy, heavy MapKit. I'm probably very, very good at MapKit. But if I have to do something with the camera or video streaming and AV foundation, like I may know nothing, you know? So keep that in mind. A lot of developers that you may think are super, super smart, I'm not saying they're not smart, but they're very, very smart in one area. 
Um, doesn't mean they're smart in like all the areas. Don't get me wrong, when it comes with experience and you need to learn that new area, you'll probably pick it up pretty quickly. But I don't know, I just thought this was a, a good piece of perspective here. I'll read it one more time. That senior developer who is a genius in one subject is a junior developer in another subject. On to the design portion of the show here. We have Design for iPad by Vadit here. Uh, this is a very visual article. I'm a big fan of visual articles here, but basically it talks about the, the basics of designing an app uh, for the iPad here. We'll talk about layout and readable margins. Here you can see, and I see this time and time again in some not so great iPad apps, right? Where you just stretch the constraints all the way to the edge of the screen. And that doesn't look right. Um, here on the right, that good margin, right? You want that middle, middle bit. But this whole article is stuff like that, like how to utilize the large screen. Uh, here's the, an actual real example, right? You'd want to, you know, the sidebars that I said are, are coming into play, which we'll see here in a little bit. But you can see how you just totally like shift the UI to cater towards this big screen. And, you know, as the iPad becomes more of a uh, computer, as they say, and, and how the, the line between iPad app and Mac app gets really, really blurred, I feel like a lot of developers are going to have to be uh, very, no very knowledgeable harsh, but like you should know the basics of designing an iPad app. For example, on the phone, this is a bottom slide up card. On the iPad, it's a context menu, right? So, um, and I think we get into sidebars down here a little bit. I don't know. But anyway, definitely go through this whole article. It's very long, very detailed. There's videos, as you can see here. We'll play one, uh, but talking about uh, just the various design principles of an iPad. So I thought this was very thorough, uh, very good way to get started on like just understanding the basics of designing for iPad. All right, to finish things off, we got AR Corner here, and I got a bunch of them here from Alvin Fu. We have a mock-up of what AR glasses could potentially look like. And I know the latest like renderings I've seen kind of look like this, where it's like one sheet of glass, almost like those like 1980s sunglasses that, you know, that all the cool kids wore back then. Um, anyway, like, like I always say with these AR Corner stuff, um, this is just concepts to get your mind going of what like could possibly be and, and maybe spark some ideas uh, of your own. Um, this one, I think, could be uh, considered a bit... Uh, a bit much, um, but here by uh, Ben Geskin here, this could be like your, your desk in AR mode, right? You got three screens around you, all these widgets floating around the keyboard down there. Uh, yeah, to me, this is a bit much. <laughs> like, I don't know how I would deal with all this stuff floating around my face, uh, but again, interesting concept. Next up here, we have, oh, this one's fun here by uh, Eric Natsky. You got a couple from Eric here, but you can kind of like Legoify things uh, here. So you have like real world objects that just get like, Legoified. I don't know. I thought that was like pretty cool. And you'll see here they like break apart in a second. I don't know. Again, the acid trip that AR might be uh, is insane. And here's another one from Eric. Um, this is more so about the uh, uh, surface interactions. Like what I liked here about these crayons is like you can watch them like rolling up surfaces. Like watch when he like picks up the iPad Pro box, they'll kind of like roll off of it like they should. I don't know. I thought that was like really, really cool with the surface uh, interaction. You can see they're falling into a box which in their world, that box like doesn't, ex I don't know, it's kind of crazy. Moving on, one more here, or there's one more after this one. Um, the Sports Science Show. I don't know if you ever watched this on like ESPN, but you can see like a TV show with sports science in AR, like on your kitchen table. I like this, how they pause it, and then they'll like back up and put like an elephant there. Um, anyway, yeah, just, I think AR is gonna be like insane. I, you know, we are a few years away, and like I said, it's gonna, it's really gonna pop off with the glasses, but I just love looking at this stuff. And then finally, we have this bird, which looks insanely real. Um, like, I mean, you can, you can obviously tell it's fake, but like, man, it, it doesn't look like a cartoon. It doesn't look, it looks real. It looks like it belongs there. That's insane. Anyway, that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode of Swift News. Apologize for the echo. Again, I'm in my empty apartment, but we'll see you in a couple weeks.